Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the first night in Helsinki and the icebreaker. We indeed uh, had a nice welcome yesterday in the city hall, for which we are really grateful. And since we are already in a delay, I would like to invite Tana Hellström, CEO of Helsinki Zoo, uh, on the stage. Dear friends, welcome to Helsinki. Finland has had an excellent year in international field. We joined NATO, now we feel safe. We morally won Eurovision Song Contest. Cha cha cha. And now you all are here for the first time. I know that for many of you, this is first time in Finland. So I give you some tips how quickly get the taste of Finland. Finns drink more coffee per head than any other people in the whole world. So here we have coffee served non-stop, so you easily get that feeling. In Finland we have the saying, quantity overrules quality. And that's definitely true with our coffee. Uh, it, it's maybe not very great taste experiment, but it will keep you awake during the conference. Uh, in Finland, there are over two million saunas, and most Finns take sauna once or more per week. There is sauna in your hotel. There are public saunas, one just in neighborhood. And there is also sauna in our zoo. You'll see that one too. In Finland, nature is not only wild, it's free. Finnish law states that anyone living or visiting Finland has the right to roam the uh, countryside, forest, much, mushrooms and berries, and enjoy recreational use of nature areas, even on privately owned land. And the closest nature reserve areas are just tram stops away from here. And in Finland, there are also most amount of heavy metal bands per capita. So be prepared for the social programs. Helsinki is aiming to be a sustainable city, as you heard uh, yesterday. And one of the goals is to be carbon neutral by 2030. We have the same goal as a zoo. We also wanted to make sustainable choices in this Congress in Helsinki. We have no printed booklet. All the information is in app. We are not giving you any unnecessary material. We have the backs and pencils for those that needed them. And we are also decided to serve you vegetarian meals and sustainable fish. Yes. It's really easy to survive one week without meat. But if you struggle, you have the choice of reindeer in gala dinner. Flying around the world isn't very environmentally friendly, as we all know. On the other hand, we human beings are social animals and we need interaction and that cannot be re replaced by online meetings. We have all had experience of that recent years, and it's not good for us and does not further our goals. Uh, so we, it's necessary to meet. Uh, we in Korkeasar, we have decided to compensate all our flights, and I encourage all you to do the same. We should try to live the sustainable life which we promote. Korkasar is the zoo on the island. You'll see the place on Thursday. You are, of course, welcome to visit the zoo anytime during, the, during the, your stay in Helsinki. 
ZOO has been founded in 1889 for education and enlightenment of citizens. And that is still what we do with strong focus on saving species. You'll learn more about the zoo when you visit there on Thursday. And you won't be able to miss, miss the huge building project uh, construction site in the zoo. That is the tram bridge that city is building and we will have our own tram stop in 2027. That's not only for us, Helsinki is growing city and there is going to be a new neighborhood on the opposite bank. I have one important message for you, which I want you all to remember. Since the zoo is on island, we'll take ferries to get there. And the ferries run from 4 to 7, 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. In the uh, schedule, it says that zoo visit starts at 5, but we don't want you all rush to the ferries at the same time. The ferries run in 20 minute intervals. I wish that some of you uh, who probably don't have meetings on Thursday evening will try to get to the harbor at 4, and some don't hurry and get to the later ferries. Uh, so this way we can get you all nicely into the zoo. The program doesn't start there exactly at seven, five o'clock, but you can all start when you get there. So please remember this. I have trust in you. Uh, we have quite a few staff here, uh, it, here from Korkeasaari in this Congress, and you can recognize us from these outfits. So if you have any questions about Zoo, Helsinki or Finland, just to find some Finnish hosts in the Congress. And maybe you have noticed there are these weird sentences in the batches. So there are Finnish sayings. So if you don't understand what it means, also try to find some Finnish person to explain it for you. I'm really happy that you are all here, and I wish that we have a nice Congress. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Zana. We are also very happy to be here. Thank you for your welcome speech. Um, I learned a lot. I like the song and the heavy metal bands the most. But I know that you, you have a lot to teach us about your beautiful country, city, and your achievements. So therefore, I would like to invite uh, Honorable Pekka Havisto, Finnish politician of the Green League, uh, to the stage. So good morning, everyone, and I hope that uh, Helsinki has been treating you well. Actually, Sanna was stealing all my topics, NATO, Eurovision, and coffee. So uh, there's nothing left than to speak about animals. Um, when I was coming this morning to this conference, I was thinking the saddest zoo I have ever been. And actually, I easily remembered it because it was Kabul, Afghanistan, and it was spring 2002. Originally, this zoo was built in 1967 by the progressive king, Sahir Shah, and the Kabul Zoo was that time intended to be a window into the flora and fauna of Afghanistan. But the civil war and Taliban regime had destroyed also the zoo. Nobody paid attention to the welfare of animals, and several animals had escaped, while a large number of them were killed in shelling and crossfire. I haven't been visiting Kabul lately, but I understand that the rebuilding of the zoo has been taken place. But this sad story just reminds us what wars and conflicts cause, not only to us human beings, but also to animals. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is on to something significant. 
Animal protection, animal conservation and well-being is on everybody's lips and it has not been this important of a topic ever before in the modern times. Biodiversity is critical in maintaining the ecological balance, which we are threatening with overconsumption and expanding human action everywhere. New land use plans are also destroying natural environment. In nature, everything is interlinked. All fauna, flora, fungi and other beings in the same ecosystem need one another in different ways. And the point here is that if we lose a species from the world, if a species goes extinct, we cannot get it back. It's gone forever. Considering the lists of extinct and endangered species, which are growing all the time, this is extremely worrying. We as humans are making more and more holes to our natures, which we might never be able to fix. Zoos and aquaria are at the front lines of conservation since they provide a sanctuary for endangered animals. You make care and research possible through your work. You also take the questions of endangered species and animal well-being close to the public. If people wouldn't have seen tigers or pandas and noticed them as living beings that are being wiped out, there wouldn't be to talk about them either. Even though we live in our concrete jungles, for us to thrive, we need nature that is also thriving. This means we cannot be wiping out species after species into extinction. Before the times when mankind can grow without hurting other living beings on its way, you are doing something no one else cannot. No one else has the capability nor the skills to protect animals that are struggling to survive. This makes you and your work unique and irreplaceable. Thank you for working for our future and for the animals that we share our world with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the uh, welcome speech. Um, this highlighted for me how important uh, is that we can be here as a community and save this community spirit and uh, uh, do all our activities in a collaborative approach. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have a pre-recorded uh, welcome speech from Siapa Pieti Kainen, Finnish politician and member of the European Parliament. Please welcome the speech. Hello. We have come a long way from the past history, history where zoos used to be a freak shows with exotic animals and small cages. Nowadays everybody, at least I think everybody, knows the great importance of the biodiversity work, protection work and educational work that the zoos do. Firstly, and the most importantly, the zoos and their knowledge play a key role in preserving very threatened species and endangered species. Of course, it uh, can't replace the fact that we should <clears throat> uh, reverse the time and put place uh, the existing ecosystems and start really doing this kind of uh, preserving of the nature. But then when the situation is very acute, actually it is only the zoos who can uh, save the small amount of the animal and species for the future, for the better days to, to come when we can appreciate the biodiversity and rewild the nature. The second is, of course, educational. And now I'm not talking about... Uh, Small uh, children, I'm talking about veterinaries, I'm talking about a biologist, I'm talking about understanding different kind of animals, their living uh, behaviors, their diseases, how they change in different kind of environments, living environments. And the third is, of course, the educational. Of course, all of us think that uh, it's nice to go to a zoo, 
to see exotic animals and very lovely pets and even if you're very lucky to try to touch some of them. But the most important part of the education is to sensitize people for the fact that animals are sentient beings and they have the right for the planet as well as we humans do. To sensitize <clears throat> us for the fact how we are destroying the living habitats of animals and to activate us on preserving the nature and rewildering them and treating all the animal with humble, and, uh, humble graceful uh, appreciation as a partners sharing the same planet. I wish all the best on your work. See you in Zeus and maybe somewhere else. And uh, all the best uh, for the Congress. Thank you very much. And after all these welcoming words, it is my great privilege to officially welcome you and open the 2023 annual meeting of the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Dear Sana, dear Honorable Pekka Havisto, thank you for the welcoming us uh, in the most functional and happiest city of the world. I hope, dear colleagues, that you have already had a chance to have a sip of the positive vibe of the city. This is certainly the best thing to celebrate our achievements. Challenge the status quo and take another big leap in our progressing with a community of more than 430 members in 47 countries all over the world. Look at these numbers. 40, 430 zoos, aquariums, national associations, and corporate members with thousands of expert colleagues driven by the same idea. Defining and demonstrating excellence in species conservation through transparent and collaborative approach. What a strength lies in this alliance. The Azure Alliance are its people and their dedication. Over the past three decades, many fantastic personalities have contributed to the Azure growth. Sadly, one of, the, one of them has recently passed away. Lars Lundig Andersen, Director Emeritus of Copenhagen Zoo. Lars will be remembered for his immense dedication to Azure and many key moments in the history of, of the association. He served on air as a council for 16 years. In March 1995, he proposed the development of a new air as a committee on exhibit design and education and chaired this committee until 24, so 2004, developing the first set of air as education standards, joint education conferences, and laying the groundwork for air as academy. He also led air as activities, being a strong champion for increasing Lobby, lobby capacity, and the AIRS accreditation program. He was very deserving of the AIRS Lifetime Achieving Award that was given in 2011, and I'm sure will be remembered by all from his legacy, his influence. Please join me paying a tribute uh, to Lars Lundig Andersen, and sadly, our thoughts also go to the family and colleagues of the keeper who lost her life in a tragic incident with the white rhino in Salzburg too, yesterday. Thank you very much. And now, dear colleagues, let me introduce a work which is an excellent presentation, How Strong Are We as an Alliance? In 2019, as a charter specialist company to carry out a study to assess the joint social economic impact and conservation, education, and research efforts of all zoos and aquaria of the association. These data they derived represented, representative of 2019 shows that those as a members jointly generated 3,003 million euros of value added into the economy. This includes household income, tax revenues, and company profits and savings. Those as zoos and aquariums experienced some 
144 million visits annually, with approximately 25 million visits from abroad, bringing additional value to support the region and the local community. Around 65% of all EASA members are in urban environments, highlighting the importance that, uh, of the opportunity to connect to nature for the increasing numbers of people living in urban environments. Each individual member participated on average in 10 in-situ conservation projects, with some reaching as high as 52 projects. Of the population of about 500 million in the European Union, about 1% was reached with formal education activities on top of the informal education that was experienced during the 144 million visits. An interactive dashboard will be made available to members whereby they can see all the summary data for all EASA members by region and by country. We are really proud of the impact of the members, appreciate the cooperation in the finalization of the study, and kindly offer this information together with the figures of the conservation database to aid informed decisions and discussions with various stakeholders. I also wish wish to express my greatest gratitude to, to the individuals, as a members and other organizations who have made more than 11,000 donations, raising about 2 million euros in the EASA Ukraine Zoo's emergency fund. A special thanks goes to colleagues in other continents who are supporting the fund. I think about the numerous VASA members whose aquariums, and I would like to extend my special thanks to the zoo community in Australasia. Asia. A few weeks ago, the Zoo and Aquarium Association organized a successful fundraiser whose proceeds will go to our fund and thus to the zoos in Ukraine that need our con continued support. We see that the war is sadly continuing. AASA encourages our members to pick a day or week in November for their own fundraiser. Possible activities could range from bake sale to dinner with the director, let your creativity take over. An information pack with data and visuals provided by our Ukrainian colleagues will be shared for us for use as part of the your fundraiser. I sincerely hope it is not an overstatement to stay to say that this year's conference is unusual in that our conversation are no longer overshadowed by the COVID pandemic, and uh, that the, the season has also brought relief to the majority of our members from budgetary point of view. When the pandemic hit us, the association had adequate reserves, so much so that for a while we were able to ease the burden of the membership fees and compensate for the resulting shortfall. But the energy crisis related extra expenses that followed and the filling of the significant black backlog required intervention sooner than expected in terms of both workforce and income. I sincerely thank the members for their advanced confidence, agreeing the gradual membership fee increase that was approved by the last AGM to be enacted from 2024. This will stabilize as finances and enable support across all our activities towards achieving our strategic ambitions. While some activities have been scaled back in the past three years, the work in the governance and the management of the association is accelerated. And the duties related to extraordinary events, such like membership issues and crisis communication, seem to become ordinary items in the everyday work. This has already been anticipated uh, before the crisis, and the external review of the office structure was endorsed by the Executive Committee in 2020. The reorganization and stepwise growth of the executive offices in progress, leading to a fully realized new organization structure from 2025 onwards. Parallel with this process, the decision making and information flow between the governing and the managing bodies is also under review. And proposals aiming more balanced engagement, better defining, defined roles in the board, and sharing of workload and responsibilities is going to be discussed by the Council before the end of this year. This work also aims to investigate new structures that could aid the involvement of our diverse membership and senior leaders in different phases of the decision-making 
and explore the enhancement of skills and expertise beyond the traditional zoological domains. This framework shall secure the healthy growth, future-proof structures, and continuing transparency in our democratic governance. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the office staff uh, for their hard work and pragmatism as they strive to overcome the vicious circle of lockdowns, traffic challenges, and pressure to revitalize the operative work in the past years. In the same way, I'm really thankful for all those constructive, constructive criticism and support I and we received in the past years from our members. These are very important building blocks of the work we are shaping for the upcoming Council meeting. We can be proud of our steady progress and increasing impact in the EU stakeholder consultations, various discussions at CITES, and leading on IUCN motions. Proven by the benchmarking against other organizations, we are leading brand in animal welfare, accreditation, and science-based management of zoos and aquariums. In order to strengthen our position and credibility in the highest forums of lobby and advocacy, we must have a strong frame of standards and policies. Various documents and proposals under development, such as the updates to the animal acquisition and disposition policy, the standards for accommodation and care, and the accreditation cycle, tabled in the upcoming Council and AGM to help EASA keep moving forward towards the strategy goals. The development of these documents is driven by the ambitions of the members laid down in our vision and mission and in the 2021 to 2025 EASA strategy. Our ambitions have never vanished, not even during the recent crisis, although one must always consider that a strong association can only be built with strong members. Our resilience and real strength come on the one hand from the community spirit, the delicate network of professionals, knowledge sharing and trust in each other. We must save this embedded in our deeper structures, building bridges in every direction within and beyond the association. All the developments shall follow supportive attitude and demonstrate that the guidance is available for everyone anytime as needed. On the other hand, resilience as members can be greatly enhanced by utilizing the highest possible variety of progressive knowledge and tools offered by our excellent community. Dear colleagues, we live in an accelerating world. The paradigm change also in the evolution of the zoos and aquariums is advancing. We should look at the challenges as an opportunity, use the power of the association as a lifeline, and never miss a chance to save the momentum that we gained. Dear colleagues, I wish you all have positive vibes the city can offer us. Have a great conference and don't forget to enjoy your time. Thank you very much. And now, let me invite uh, Mr. Henry Griffith, Executive Director of the Association, and give summary of the ad. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It is lovely to see so many of you here in front of me and hopefully lots of you joining online as well. If you can't be with us here in Helsinki, there are a range of plenaries throughout the week that will be live streamed through Facebook, so please do join us in that forum as well. Now, those of you who have seen me present before will know that I like to start my presentations with maybe some data, a quiz or an interesting visual. And so for this, our first time in Finland, I wanted to think about what could I do? And of course, I went to our good friend Google, although actually I didn't need to do that. I just needed to listen to our previous presenters today to know that Finland is one of the happiest countries in the world, regularly ranked up there. And we've already had lots of fun and enjoyment so far. There is this amazing nature and the northern light. And of course, the love of coffee and a good sauna. Did I pick any of those as our analogy to our IASA work? No, I went with a bucket. Now, any of you that might have been with the Yaza a few years might remember a Korkasari Zoo colleague a few years ago presenting about their citizen conservation work attacking the invasive alien slugs. And what they were looking to do was engage the local communities to collect these slugs out of nature 
protect the native biodiversity. But funnily enough, the citizens around Helsinki were less than enthused about collecting slugs from nature and bringing them to the zoo. That was until our amazing colleagues tapped into the Finnish love of buckets. They realized that a Finnish person loves nothing better than a free bucket. So what they did for their conservation work is they provided free buckets. And lo and behold, their slugs rolled in. Buckets and buckets and buckets of slugs, these invasive alien slugs, came into the zoo. So this, for me, more than anything else, the love of a bucket represents the Finnish people for me. And how do we link from buckets to IASA? Well, actually, this is where I feel the IASA strategy is like a good bucket. Many of us here in the room are or have been a zookeeper or an aquarius, and we know the value of a good bucket. It needs to be big enough to carry everything we need to get to where we're going. But we've all had that really like clunky bucket that's too big. It like bangs against your leg, it slows you down, and it tips things everywhere. That's the bucket that we don't want. We want to be that valuable bucket that keeps us going. And this is definitely how I view our strategy as a really important element to keep us focused, to keep us going in the right direction altogether. And just like any good bucket, it needs to keep all those contents inside when you're going across that rough paddock, when you're walking up and down those stairs in your aquarium. We want it to be stable and secure. And definitely from an IASA perspective, both as individual members and as an association, it's been a rocky few years. We've had to keep our things in our bucket as best we can, going through COVID, the war in Ukraine, and the energy crisis. But this is where we see a little bit of red. We look at the progress towards our strategy that we achieved in 2022. Yeah, there are some things that we've had to put on hold, some things that we needed to postpone. As always, we have a lot of orange in there because many of our uh, um, ambitions in the strategy are long-term. They're not going to be complete until 2025. So we're always going to see a bunch of orange. But what I want to focus on, and throughout my presentation today, is that green, the amazing achievements that we've made to keep progressing with our strategy, to keep our bucket full and going forward. We spread, spread the actions in our strategy across our five different focal areas. So we're seeing good achievement across all of those, keeping with good progress. Some amazing activities in the last year have included approval of the new field conservation standards, our work with the IASA 21 Plus campaign, finally getting to have our first in-person animal welfare forum after being delayed because of COVID. Lots of good progress and activities throughout the community and across those focal areas. And as Andre alluded to in his speech, one of the things that we wanted to do with the strategy was make sure that we had the right structures and support in place from the executive office so that we're able to be there for you as members to support all the work you're doing for achievement of the strategy. So the reorganization process within the office is going to take place in a stepwise uh, uh, way over the next few years. And what I wanted to share with you now was just the current structure and how we're progressing with that going forward. So this is what we look like. And very much our executive office structure is built around the strategy and indeed our vision of progressive zoos and aquariums saving species together with you. So you'll see on the left-hand side there, we have April Adams as our director of our member development department. So this is really taking the lead on that progressive zoos and aquarium element. They're there to help with accreditation, professional development and training through the academy, and of course, the amazing work we can do developing ourselves through our conferences and events. The saving species, unsurprisingly, maybe that is under our species conservation department, headed up here by Danny DeMann. And within this department, we see Raymond Vandermeer as our Director of Conservation and Population Management, leading our teams in animal programs and conservation and population management. And see, so these are the people that work most closely with our EP coordinators and our tag chairs supporting the amazing work you do, making decisions to keep our programs and our animals healthy. We've also collated staff under a new field conservation and science team. And this then brings the field conservation work to help save species alongside the ex situ work that we see in the conservation and population management department. Also, of course, underpinning that with the science that we need to make our decisions. So some of the staff in there include elements of the biobank work, the reproductive management group and animal welfare science as well. And then last but not least, we have Thomas Rusek, who is heading up the Advocacy and Communications Department. This is about the with you part of our vision. With you meaning us as individual members, but also external stakeholders as well. And this involves staff that are involved in our policy work, not only at the EU level, but regionally and globally as well. 
of course, all those important communications, making sure that you as the Yaza members know what's going on, but also the wider world knows what's going on and know how amazing we are as well. And of course, we can't forget that we do need money to make this happen. So our funding coordinator is in that department as well. So this is where we're going as an office. These are how our new departments are stacking up. You'll be introduced to um, existing and new staff through the e-news. So that's the best way to connect. And of course, the team here at conference are wearing our amazingly bright orange lanyards. No, I, I love the lanyards here, Sana, but, but we wanted to stick out. So if you have any questions about the executive office or you need to connect with staff, keep an eye out for somebody with the orange lanyard and ask them lots of questions. We'll be more than happy to help you out. So moving on. Thinking about that member development department, I mentioned a core part of that work is our accreditation program. And we've been really uh, catching back up after COVID with our existing member accreditation. We've done an awful lot of screenings so far this year, some of which are going to have their uh, uh, results approved by council later on this week. And we still have screenings planned for the rest of the year. All of this heading towards finishing our first cycle by spring 2024. We want to get through our very first accreditation cycle by that time. And so if you haven't scheduled your screening yet, please do contact Borja, because at the moment, we're at 92% of the ARSA members. We're so close to 100%. So we just need to pick that up to finish those last few members off uh, by early next year. I realize I put that in twice because I really do want that last 8% to pop their hand up and be screened. But also on the flip side, if you would like to be a screener, if you have the skills and experience to support the accreditation program, to visit our members and provide some wonderful peer support, we're looking for new screeners as well. So uh, scan the QR code on the screen or come and speak to Borja or April. We'd love to have you join our screening team as well. So that was about our existing members. And what we do have is an awful lot of new members wanting to get in our IASA bucket. They want to be part of our club. And what I will say is thank you to all of those new member applications that have been very patient with us, because what we've done is focused on the existing members and screening and catching up with accrediting them. And a lot of our new member applications have been put on hold. So thank you for your patience with that. But we are now building up the capacity to get back to our new members. You'll see there's a lot of people want to come and join. So we have managed to screen a few of them in 2023. More will come next year including not only full member zoos and aquarium, but also candidates for membership as well and associate members. So we're looking to grow and build all the time. And talking about growing and building, of course, this is perhaps one of my favorite slides. It's full of numbers and it's full of big numbers, demonstrating how strong we are as a diverse community with a range of different types of membership, all contributing to helping us achieve our vision. And, you know, I do like that the numbers are so big. I feel we have more members than any other association in the world. So that's always nice to have. Some other numbers here moving from accreditation into the IASA Academy. So we've had a range of training that's been delivered over the past year, both live, in person and indeed online training as well, with a range of participants from lots of different institutions all over the world. A lot of our training can be just specific to IASA members, but we recognize that we want to share our expertise and it, it invites uh, non-IASA members using the programs to come and join us as well. Thinking about the training that's going on, just yesterday we had an amazing course that was sold out on trailblazing trainers to look at animal training. And uh, definitely in speaking to the tutors at the icebreaker last night, I get the feeling this is going to be a regularly occurring event prior to conferences. So if you didn't manage to get onto the course this year, and keep an eye out for the uh, training that will happen hopefully next year pre our Leipzig conference. We still have some places on the in-person animal welfare assessments course that's going to take place in October and a Zoom for medical training that will be online uh, from October as well. The QR codes on the screen there, if you can capture them, that gives you more information or you can find it on the main IASA website. And as we go into 2024, we have the introduction to EP management, that's by invitation only to our program holders exhibit design and planning, collaborative courses with partnerships, and some more pre-conference courses for our Conservation Forum and Animal Welfare Forum next year as well. So lots of opportunities to engage with professional development, lots of opportunities to grow and learn together as a community. And if you can't make it in person, we also have a range of free online courses that are available. Uh, earlier this year, our reproductive management group, our RMG, developed a reproductive management 
massive open online course, MOOC, all the letters of the alphabet in there. And this was launched and was super, super successful. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, joined and all of the resources, the presentations and the videos from that MOOC are still going to be available for you if you didn't manage to engage in person uh, online at the time. So uh, please do head onto the website and you'll see the link to sign up to get access to those resources. We already have a freely available animal welfare assessment self-paced training module online and that's going to be added to with an introduction to animal welfare module as well coming later this year. And don't worry if your education staff, we're not forgetting about you either. We're launching an online hub for educators later on this year as well. So whether it's in person or online, lots of wonderful opportunities to engage. Moving on now to spend a bit of time talking about activities under our different focal areas. So we have our first one here in terms of leading in aquarium and animal management and care. Zoo and aquarium, animal management and care. And so a lot of this work focuses around our population management programs and support for the species that we're privileged to care for. And I'm really, really pleased and proud to see so many EASA best practice guidelines that are being published. Not only supporting ourselves as EASA members, make sure that we have the latest specialist knowledge to care for our animals, but we make these publicly available as well. So any zoo or aquarium can also access this valuable information. And we can just see the range of expertise and species diversity covered by these best practice guidelines, really highlighting that we are the experts in caring for animals, irrespective of what species or taxa they may be involved in. But it's not just species best practice guidelines we have. We also have some subject ones. And I'm really excited to share that we have animal training guidelines that are available as well, really giving some good solid um, support and guidance to help us manage the animals in our care. When we think about managing uh, healthy animals in healthy populations, that really starts with our regional collection plans, our RCD process. And the element here is that the different taxonomic advisory groups have their regional collection plan, and we identify which species we feel like we can support within our um, zoos and aquariums, and more importantly, why. Which, what are the roles and the goals for the programs underneath each of these uh, tax and advisory groups? The regional collection plans are developed with ER the colleagues, but also external stakeholders as well, making sure that we're getting the latest information from all possible avenues. You can find the approved ones in the member area on the ER the website, and they'll be added to by new ones where we've had workshops that have either been held in 2022 or 23 those species RCPs will become available soon once we finalize the content. And this really acts as a guide to why we should be keeping different animals in our zoos and aquariums. It's the first step of that process. Then the next step is to say, okay, these are the ones that we're looking to have new style EEPs for. And we're up to 291 EEPs so far. Again, a really good range of species coming out of those RCPs when we're looking to have our ERs or ex-situ programs for these individuals. And this is where we're at, because part of our population management structure is to move everything across to the new style EEPs. So the set of graphs on the far left there is showing the development of those new style EEPs over time. And then the next two are how we're um, moving away from the old style and the ESBs, with the aim that we're going to get all of our programs into new style EEPs in the next couple of years. You'll see we're at about a total of 463 programs across all of those elements. So definitely we're looking to grow the programs and the conservation species support that we can give. And this is where now, if you are excited by Yaza work, you want to you know, be a more active part in that bucket, we are of course looking for coordinators to run some of these new unapproved programs. So if you uh, fancy becoming an EEP coordinator, scan the QR code or speak to some of the colleagues here, find out what programs are available and how you can contribute to good program management across our community. So we have our regional collection plan, high level roles and goals. We then have our specific EEPs that are defining which programs we're going to run. And then the next step of that is the long-term management plan. So this is the much more detailed element over the next sort of five years about how many animals you may want to breed or not want to breed, who should be paired up, what are some of the considerations for that program. And you can see that we're able to increase the range of long-term management plans that we're able to produce um, year on year. We're very close already to what we hit last year, and there's still some months left. So I'm really pleased to see this beautiful increasing graph of activity. And that's supported by the population management staff in the office, but also you out there as coordinators as well, 
coming in with your expertise to make sure that we have these plans. And these plans are all again available from the ER, the member area. So if you're keeping this species within your zoo or aquarium and you want more detail about what the plans are for it, how it's going to grow or not grow or whatever, then have a look at the long-term management plan in the member area. A lot of that was more internally focused, helping us as the Yaza members look after the species in our care. But we also want to do a lot of external promotion as well. We want the wider world to know what Yaza's ex situ programs are about, why we are keeping these animals, what are the roles and goals of these programs. And so then this is where we have our publicly facing EEP pages. These are added to all the time. So every time I do this presentation, I have to get a new screen grab because there's more added. But just to give you an example, of course, we have a beautiful one from Korkazari Zoo here. He managed the Forest Reindeer Program. So you can see who the program coordinator is. There is a link on that page into the member area so you can get into that regional collection plan or any long-term management plans. And it gives a, an idea about the IUCN status. If you scroll down the page, it then gives you the specific agreed uh, roles for that program. And these vary depending on the different programs. So for our forest reindeer here, we can see we have some direct conservation roles and indirect conservation roles. And why is this important? Well, not only does it give us as the Yaza members a really clear steer for why we look after this animal, where we can make impact, where we can see progress to support this species, but it also provides a really great um, assessment mechanism because we can say, are we meeting these roles and goals? Are we actually doing what we want to do? And hurrah, if we are, let's celebrate that. But maybe we're not. And then why are we not? What can we do to really help our programs achieve the roles that we set for them? So it is really important that we have these established roles and goals, not only for us as a community, but also to demonstrate to the wider world that we are serious about what we do and the species that we care for contribute both directly and indirectly to conservation. Another new initiative to talk about promotion of our EEPs is the Keeping Up with EEP series that you'll see on our social media. This takes one of those EEP programs and just provides a little snapshot, again, of those roles and goals, really evidencing the work that we do, the coordination, and why we're looking after that species from a conservation perspective. If you're interested in being featured, you'll have your program as one of our Keeping Up with the EEPs, then do contact uh, Sandrine, our communications coordinator. But it's not just the physical animals themselves that are important in terms of program management, but also their genetics and demography. And so an aspect of that, of course, is our work with the EASA Biobank. I'd like to give thanks to our four biobank hubs in Antwerp, Copenhagen, uh, IZW and RZSF, who are uh, doing an amazing role keeping all of those samples. And that role is growing and growing because the number of samples in the biobank is growing and growing. Over 200,000 samples now. So if you're not regularly sending your samples in, if you're a, a vet working at an ER as a member institution, it's not part of your protocol to be like, oh, going to send this sample off to the biobank, then please just add that to your routine. There's lots of advice and guidance on the web page about how to collect samples, how to send them, etc. A lot of that work is about the communications and outreach. And of course, we love our record keeping. We love our data. So looking to use the ZIMS biobank storage module to uh, manage that data. I did want to give special thanks to those who have um, uh, added their historical collection to the biobank. That's been amazingly useful from ZSL, Global, and Gdansk. We really appreciate your historical collections being added to the biobank as well. And we recognize here that the biobank is still growing. There's a lot of work and involvement there, but there's also a whole world of cryopreservation as well. And we don't currently within the IASA have the capacity to do the cryopreservation cryopreservation ourselves. I can't even say it, let alone have the capacity to do it. Um, and this is where we then work with partners so that we are linking up with the cryopreservation network so that we're able to have both um, biobanking and cryopreservation joined together so that we have the fullest sort of security net there possible when it comes to genetic material. And some of that, of course, involves forging global connections as well, not just concentrating only within our European and Western Asia community, but globally too. I'm going to move now on to our next focal area about maximizing our conservation impact and engagement. And this then is my annual pledge request to add data to the conservation database. Uh, we really uh, value uh, evidence of all the conservation work that you're all involved in. In particular this year, we of course 
always encourage you to add your data, but specifically if you're doing work on European species and that's not added to the database yet, please do add it. If you only get the opportunity to add one piece of conservation work to the project, then prioritize the European species work. Not only because we're in Europe and we have a special responsibility to European species, but also there's an awful lot of European biodiversity legislation happening at the moment. And the more we can evidence how we can support that legislation, how we can help local and regional governments meet these conservation targets through our existing work, the better and stronger we can position ourselves as a valuable stakeholder in those conversations. And if you want to get into conservation work or you're looking for partnerships within conservation work, then I recommend you go to the conservation database map. You can search this to find out what's going on by year or member or species or continent. And then depending on what you want to work with, I maybe have a slight mm, not so secret passion for pigs. In addition to buckets, I do like a good pig. And so this is where my example will be. I look up the pigs and peccary. What kind of pig and peccary conservation projects are we involved in? And what I'm super pleased as is I did an update on this. And there's four more projects in the database since last year, just on pigs alone. Yes. So I would really encourage you to add your data to the conservation database. Um, it enables us to make infographics like this. So this is where we were with the data added from the 2021 work. Do you think our requests to add data have made a difference? Have you been hard at work adding your data to the conservation database? I want to see more nods, head in, head nodding around the room. Yeah, so fantastic. When we look at what we've done in terms of adding the data, data to the database for 2022 work, we've massively increased the amount of uh, evidence from staff hours and funding way more members have been adding their data thank you so much we've gone from 400 species to 600 over 600 species evidence of conservation work being carried out and we see that uh, those activities sort of changing some of the areas of uh, species support a lot more multi-species support coming through now we have more work in the database and also evidencing that our work takes place across the whole world yes we have a focus on european species but we're active in all uh, continents across the world as well so thank you for those who've added your data. There's a few members still to add data. I'm very much hoping next year when I stand here and give you the 2023 data. Well, just think about how big the numbers will be then. We can also track this data over time. Um, this is a, sort of a five year span. You can see we had that little dip in both um, funding, but not so much staff hours. We kind of committed the staff, but we didn't have as much spare money in 2020, 21 in terms of our COVID impact. And we're slowly bringing our uh, um, contributions back up to those pre-COVID levels. So again, I can't wait till we have next year to look at how this graph is increasing. And this sort of infographics is invaluable, not only for uh, the executive office staff, when we're looking to deal with our policy work and speak to politicians on your behalf, but they're there for you to use as well. If you want to talk to your local ministers, to um, your stakeholders, your board, about why you're part of IASA and how you're able to contribute as a conservation community, these infographics are super valuable in being able to do that. And I mentioned already a lot of biodiversity legislation that's coming through. There's a lot of changes there and a lot of opportunities for us as zoos and aquariums to evidence the work we're doing and how we can be supporting achievement of these biodiversity targets. A lot of that work has been going on through our ER the 21 plus campaign. And you can find out more about how that campaign has been going, what the activities and resources available are in the plenary later on this week. And also I have a sneak peek of the next campaign. I can tell you it's going to be amazing. And if you want to know how amazing, you're going to need to come to that conservation plenary and find out more. This then brings you on to our next focal area about representing our community. A lot of this work focuses on our lobbying activities, both globally and indeed locally. Just after the annual conference last year, a number of colleagues from the executive office and amongst the membership went out to the CITES COP19. Uh, there was a lot of opportunity here to expand our capacity and that's part of our strategy. And it's great to see increasing opportunities for IASA to share our expertise within this forum. We're particularly focusing on lots of different things, but ideally on um, songbirds are coming out of our silent forest campaign. And so not only will we be able to provide expertise to help decision making and listing of songbirds, but also having a side event as well to really demonstrate our work and our availability to help support effective CITES decision making. 
Not soon after the CITES COP, there was the Convention on Biological Diversity COP, and coming out of this CBD COP was the um, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Lots of big words there. But basically, this is setting a bunch of conservation-related targets, biodiversity-related targets that are going to trickle down through to regional and national governments in terms of legislation and opportunities to conserve biodiversity. And again, this is an amazing opportunity for us and our community to demonstrate our expertise and support for achieving these biodiversity targets. And again, not just focusing on uh, sort of the animals themselves, but also their genetics, we were able through our increased capacity to help co-sponsor a side event on genetic diversity. So really representing ER's expertise and our ideals within these global forums. At a local level, I, I don't know whether I really want to talk about the joy of Brexit and, uh, <laughs> and animal transfers, but we are seeing slow and steady improvement. I know from speaking to many of you, it is difficult to move animals between the UK and the EU and back and forth. But absolutely thank you to everybody that is persisting with that, that is sharing their uh, examples of transfer certificates and their experiences. Obviously a lot of uh, close work with BIASA and members um, directly involved, but also with other associations such as VDZ and AFDPZ to think about transfer routes. And indeed, our amazing records keeping working group has been invaluable in sharing examples of records to help us keep this steady improvement going. So I encourage you not to lose heart, Keep trying to send those animals, keep working to achieve the program roles and goals that we have, and we will get there together. We've also had a lot of work continuing to do with animal health, and much of this has been in conjunction with EAZWV. We've had a joint position statement on the veterinary medicines cascade and how that can be applied to uh, zoo and aquarium animals to help keep us, uh, um, those animals healthy and with availability to veterinary medicines that are going to support their welfare. We're working also together on a uh, position statement in relation to bird flu vaccinations and harmonization of attitudes and opportunities to access that type of vaccination as well. We're nearly there with our handbook on the animal health law in zoos. That will be published later this year. This handbook is going to tell you everything you need to know about the new animal health law and how to apply it in your zoo and aquarium. But it's not just for you, it's for your member state authorities as well that are applying this health law to your organizations. So definitely this is aimed at you as members, but also please do share it with your state vets because it's going to help them assess you as well. And as we're growing and we're increasing our capacity, I also mentioned within this department we have an element of funding. So we've applied for an Erasmus Plus grant, an EU grant, to help us develop a European zoo health education programme. We're going to find out sometime this month if we've been successful or not, and if we are, we'll be rolling out a wonderful programme of training as well to do with European Zoo Health. And last but not least, within this area of uh, lobbying and policy work, we're seeing the EU reviewing their animal welfare policy element. A lot of this is to do with like the welfare of animals that are fed out as food. And for many of us, we rely on uh, chicks as food items for a number of animals within our zoos and aquariums. And so this is where IASA is developing a, a position statement or has developed a position statement on the use of day old chicks. So that's available from the website. We'll be using it in our lobby activities from the office, but also you as individual members may wish to use it in discussions with your local authorities as well. That brings me on also within this area, we have the with you part of our vision and our partnerships. And I'm delighted that we've got Kira Milam from the IUCN Species Survival Commission talking to us about their work and our synergies as our keynote following on from me. But we also have a range of other partnerships as well. The biodiversity crisis is immense and we cannot address it all on our own. We need to work with others. And so we have a range of partners increasing all the time to work collaboratively on the activities and the way we want to go. I want to mention one special new partner. This is the EU for Oceans Coalition on Ocean Literacy. We uh, sometimes can focus maybe a little too much on our land animals and we don't always remember that we do have a range of aquarium members and aquariums within our institutions. And it's important that we're also very um, uh, open and communicative about the opportunities to help understand the ocean, the importance of it in preserving biodiversity and what activities can or cannot harm it. We have colleagues from the EU for Oceans Coalition here. They're out um, in the lobby uh, with the other exhibitors. So if you're interested in joining the coalition alongside IASA as an organization and getting involved, there's a whole range of resources and opportunities to talk about ocean literacy with your visitors 
then please do go out, find their booth and talk more to them. I know we already have a couple of members signed up and we'd love to see more of you get on board. Our fourth focal area here then is about facilitating and guiding and promoting our values and work. So there's elements in here about the variety of policies and procedures that have been developed over the past year. And just at the conference last year, after the um, uh, opening presentation, we had a session about the EASA field conservation standards. This was approved and we're moving from general conservation standards with a real specific element here to focus on field conservation. Other elements of conservation are included in other standards, but this was a clear guidance to you as members about expectations for field conservation. They're appropriate, they are scalable. We want to make sure that everybody is able to do what they can to evidence their conservation activities. Also last year, we had an update to the conservation education standards. This was partly to bring them in line with the IZE, the International Zoo Educators, and the WAZA strategy on social change. What we want to do is make sure that we're aligning our work with other bodies as well. So we just did a small update to the conservation education standards to align them with those other standards out there in the world. We also updated our EASA code of ethics. We expanded it into a code of ethics and conduct and made it really clear about our expectations for behavior from EASA members, not only as institutions, but as individuals working for those EASA members. And we also had another update last year on our position statement on culling. This was through a range of discussions about appropriate language and understanding. So this is where we're being really clear when we're talking about culling, we're talking about management euthanasia, and this is different from medical euthanasia. And the document there just really outlines the different situations and we might be using these terms and how this acts as a tool in our EASA toolbox to help with effective population management. All these documents are available on the documents pages on the public website, so please do go and have a look at them if you're not aware of them already. Moving on from more policy work to just general communications about the amazing work that you've all been doing, I was actually saying at breakfast this morning, I always have an interesting time of year where, uh, where one of my staff comes to me and says, oh, the annual report and the TAG report, they're both like 10 to 15 pages longer this year, Mavanwi. I'm like, yes, excellent, look at the great work. And that's going to cost you this much in printing. Oh, well, that's less exciting. But uh, the genuine feeling is um, joy and celebration for all the amazing work they were able to evidence in the annual report and their tag report. And they are available online, and we do have some hard copies here at the conference. So if you like you know, your hard copy of your tag report to demonstrate uh, the wonderful work you've been involved in, then please pick one of those up from the table outside. We continue to share good news in the quarterly magazine Zoo Queria, so thank you to everybody that's been writing articles for that and demonstrating our work. Again, available in hard copy, but freely available online. And of course, we have the wonderful journal of Zoo and Aquarium Research, continuing to offer free access to all the wonderful research carried out, not only in our zoos and aquariums, but places worldwide as well. It's an absolutely invaluable resource to stay up to date, to share the latest scientific advancements, not just across animal care, but I've seen uh, um, articles in there about veterinary care, about visitor studies, etc. So a whole range of topics covered by JASA. Of course, you can catch us on our social. I think that's how the kids say it these days. Uh, we have a range of different social media platforms that we look to share our work and indeed your stories. So please do tag us so that we can reshare. Um, you know, there's an opportunity for us to maximize our social media presence and get the stories that we're all involved in out to the widest possible network. We have a range of different sorts of themes going on on our social media as well. So if you want to be one of our proud zoo people, or you want to do a takeover of our Instagram account, or be a Discovery as a member, lots of opportunities to share the wonderful work that we're all doing through these platforms. From a more internal perspective, we do have our monthly e-news, and this is where you're going to get updates about new policy developments, changes in program coordinators, training opportunities, etc. So if you're not already getting e-news delivered to your inbox, then please do sign up, drop us a line at info at eaza.net, and we'll be pleased to add you to that mailing list. It really is the best way to stay up to date with all EASA development. And if that wasn't enough, maybe you saw a presentation at a previous uh, conference event or webinar and you're like, oh, well, there was something really good, I need to go back. Or maybe you couldn't make it. A lot of our uh, presentations are available on the IAZA YouTube channel. This includes a wonderful range of the welfare webinars, but also conference presentations and indeed training elements as well, 
like, for example, this Creativity with Canva uh, package that we did some training on as well. So uh, please do go and have a look at the YouTube channel. You can absolutely get a lot of good information from there as well. And then last but not least, when it comes to communication, we do have our EASA Communicators Network. So if you're involved in public relations, communications or media, maybe you are the person running the social media channel for your Zero Aquarium. Joining the Communicators Network can be a great way to stay up to date with current trends, but also share best practice. We have four online meetings um, a year, although actually I think we can have an in-person one in conference. And uh, it's a really good way to make sure that we're speaking with one voice and aware of all the different communications opportunities going on across our diverse membership. And then we come to our fifth focal area about managing our operations. And in addition to the already approved guidelines on palm oil, last year we approved guidelines on meat and soya and guidelines on timber. So again, these are available from the website. Some really great opportunities uh, and uh, advice about how to manage these products within your zoos and aquariums so that we can be sustainable in our operations, so that we can support biodiversity and not make a negative impact on it. There's a wonderful article in uh, the last Superior, um about these different guidelines with some great infographics with lovely ideas as well. So if you can't quite face reading the full guideline document, you can read a nice article in Zucraria as well. We also approved last year AISA guidelines on managing operations to reduce your environmental footprint. So these are uh, around managing waste or managing water or uh, having a green team within your organization. Lots of lovely practical advice for how you as an EASA member can continue to improve your sustainable operations to minimize your environmental footprint and really, you know, support biodiversity that we're all working towards. And then I'm surprised. I haven't seen a card that tells me I have to stop, but I'm nearly there, right? Um, so I come to the icebreaker last night. And so this is where regularly at the icebreaker, people be like, oh, how many, how many people are there, Mavanri? How many people are there? And I love it. I'm like, well, we've maybe got over 800, but you know, you have to wait to my presentation. Then I can tell you, well, this is what happened at the icebreaker last night. People are like, you do realize, Mavanwi, that in the conference app, it tells you exactly how many participants are at the conference. Well, well I love IT, but I'm not happy with this ability to ruin my fun. Um, but that didn't actually stop me because in the app, it just tells you how many participants. And those of you that know me, you know I love a spreadsheet, a little bit of a data geek. So I was like, well, there's more information I can mine. I can go into that spreadsheet of participants that we have in the office and say, not just 887 people, but all these happy faces are from 342 institutions across 70 countries. Bearing in mind, Andre told you we have Yaza members in 47. So welcome to everybody that's not in the membership yet from around the world. But, you know, this is the kind of data that I love and indeed the kind of pictures that I love. This is why we're a strong community. We're working together. We're sharing our expertise. I'd like to give immense thanks to everybody in the room and who can't be with us today for all the great work that I have the privilege to present that you've carried out in the last year. I couldn't be prouder to be in the ER's bucket with each and every one of you. I think it's a very valuable bucket to be part of. I think it's a strong and secure bucket, and it will carry us into the future to achieve our vision to be progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, dear family, thank you very much for this excellent and really visual presentation, as always, uh, about the state of affairs. It is indeed uh, a great association with huge numbers of members, with uh, huge plans, huge ambitions, and uh, great achievements, as we see, even in one year. And uh, if we look at this immense work uh, as a pyramid, with all the great foundation of our work with the animals, communication, the education. Probably it is uh, not an overstatement that the peak of this pyramid should be the great advocacy, lobby work, and the external partnerships. As such, we are very proud to have Kira Mayham, director of IUC and SSC strategic partnership here uh, in our community today. Uh, I want 
uh, still aligns, but we are very excited because we have just strengthened and reinforced our ongoing partnership with them. Kira, I just hand over. The stage is yours. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here with you. And I'm deeply regretting that I'm not as funny as my European colleagues, so I apologize in advance. You'll have to find ways to laugh at me instead. Um, but I want to begin by really, by really acknowledging the incredible expertise and work that sits here in this room, and by starting by saying thank you. you this community really does represent, in my opinion, deeply the world leaders in species conservation, certainly among the community of world leaders in species conservation around the world. Not just for the work that you do in ex situ management and in situ field protection and conservation efforts, but the veterinary science, the husbandry work, the visitor engagement and behavior change, the policy work, there are the data management, the political engagement and community engagement in so many different ways, as well as the fundraising and lots of the different elements that have already been mentioned this morning. But I wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you for the work that you're doing and to say what an honor it is for the IUCN Species Survival Commission to partner with the EASA community. I want to thank you as well in particular for that partnership. It's very deep and has run for a long time. Many of the organizations represented in this room helped to found IUCN. You've helped to create the Species Survival Commission. There are many organizations in here who partner with specialist groups who have been long-term partners with the conservation planning specialist group, with the Asian wild cattle, with wild pigs, with Asian songbirds. You've already heard and seen logos up on the screen this morning of the many relationships that exist between our two communities. Um, and I'm going to spend the next, the next uh, little while before coffee break just reflecting on the last decade of this partnership. Not to say that it's only been in existence for a decade. There was a lot of work happening before this but to just celebrate some of the huge achievements and forward progress that we've achieved together in this decade between 2013 and 2023. I'm going to look in particular at some of the connections that we've strengthened between our species experts in our different communities that is a continuum. Many, many of our experts overlap and sit within the IUCN SSC as well as the IASA community. We've strengthened and, and seen huge progress in conservation organizational partnerships, so linking between your institutions and IUCN specialist groups and other parts of IUCN, but leaps forward as well in tools and policy. And all of this only matters if we're really driving further action on the ground. So I'm going to touch on each of these points, but I'm also going to thank you in particularly and personally uh, for the EAS of partnership that helped to create my job. <laughs> um, obviously, through that, this partnership has profoundly impacted my life in so many different ways in the last decade. Uh, but in 2014, the ERs, a partnership with the SSC Chairs Office, came together to create the role of the Strategic Partnership Director within the Species Survival Commission. A huge part of this role has been looking at how we can strengthen that relationship. And so, in fact, Leslie Dickey, who was uh, head of ERs at the time, was on my interview panel. So I'm deeply, personally grateful for this partnership as well. Um, since then, and again, much of this work started before my role um, and was... And Creating that role was in part to help move these things forward, but it certainly hasn't been alone. These, everything that I will touch on in the next half an hour will, um, is really reflective of work that happens across our entire community. And I also apologize in advance if you don't see relationships that you have with the SSC reflected up here on the screen. I've really tried to, um, to capture the work that we do broadly, but across the 430 odd members of EASA and the 180 specialist groups of SSC and our 9,000 volunteer experts, there's so much work happening. So if, um, if through my presentation you think that there's something I missed, please do come and tell me. But I wanted to start by looking at the work that our two, our EASA and SSC have done in building bridges between our species experts. This has really focused a lot on strengthening the relationship between taxon advisory groups and SSC specialist groups. For those of you who aren't aware, our specialist groups are organized by taxa, like your tags, by theme, so things like conservation planning, climate change, wildlife health, and many others. And now also, which I'll talk about later, regionally. So we now have new national species specialist groups. 
And there's been lots of work done to try and strengthen the relationship in particular between our thematic but also our taxonomic specialist groups and your tags. There's huge overlap in the work that we do. And I think that the core process and tool to do this is through your world leading exit to strategy that you introduced in 2018. I do think that this is the best example of the one plan approach embedded into a process that I know of globally. And certainly we've celebrated it through many IEC and SSE channels, but are really excited to continue strengthening the links, particularly through the regional planning, uh, collection planning process, your RCPs, and wherever possible, trying to link SSE specialist groups uh, into those processes as you, as you develop them and be part of those long-term management plans. And we're really excited that the process that the EASA office has led embeds that from the start. And so anything we can do to continue strengthening that, I think is really exciting and important, but it's wonderful to see the processes and the programs that you all lead deeply embedding the conservation roles and the links with IUCN specialist groups through your planning. On our side from the SSC groups, when I started in this role, we did a survey out to all of the 180 specialist groups of SSC and asked them what partnerships they had and what partnerships they would like to have in the future with zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens. We and my boss and my colleagues pushed that survey for three months and we got seven responses. It was a, a deeply sobering moment starting in this job and looking at the road ahead. But three years later, we did the same survey and we got 107 responses in the first two weeks. There's been a huge turnaround in the awareness and the modern perception of the role, the critical roles that zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens play in species conservation and the enthusiasm with which specialist groups are looking and seeking to strengthen those partnerships. Again, I don't want to pretend that this is a divide. Many of you in the room lead specialist groups or are involved in them. And one of the things that we've been doing to strengthen and support those dual roles is to create explicitly exit to focal points within IUCN specialist groups. These positions now have terms of reference within our volunteer groups. And we ask, I'll mention some of the roles of those groups in that um, focal point in a second, but we now have just shy of 70% of specialist groups have created an exit to focal point position and are creating whole working groups around the role of exit to and in situ, a one plan approach within their species conservation planning. We hope that this will hit 100% by the end of this quadrennium, so by 2025, and we've got a big push at the moment to make that happen. I also want to acknowledge the really great role that the joint tag chairs meeting plays. These convening of the tags from different regions and the opportunity for key specialist group chairs to come or members to come and be part of those discussions, I think is really exciting. And I hope that that continues in the future. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the role that IASA and WASA and AZA play in convening those meetings. So on the exit to conservation focal points within specialist groups, these are just, these are the kind of summary of the terms of reference for those positions. They are volunteer roles, similar to your tags and EEP coordinators, um, but we ask those people to actively wear hats of advocating for the many and varied roles that ex situ experts can play within IUCN specialist groups and to really learn the IUCN ex situ management guidelines and to build capacity in applying those guidelines in our species conservation action planning for specialist groups. So it's sort of the, uh, the our side of your regional collection planning, looking at those um, regional, sorry, those species action plans that are often adopted by NGOs, by governments, and certainly by the IUCN, and making sure that your expertise and your populations that you manage and the opportunities for connecting a one plan approach to conservation across in situ and ex situ are really captured in those plans. We also did a review about six years ago of the mentions of ex situ conservation in IUCN action plans, as well as in government national biodiversity strategies and action plans. It was remarkably a declining trend and fewer than 40% at that time mentioned ex situ as anything other than a last resort. So many of us sitting in the room might think that this is, this is something that we only had to deal with a few decades ago and surely this is more integrated by now. It is certainly something that still needs a lot of work and a lot of awareness raising for the opportunities to connect ex situ and in situ more effectively to drive species conservation priorities. These roles also play a really important, um, an important job in helping to communicate and, and, collabor and drive collaborations between organisations. And uh, I've actually just been reminded that 
the reason I picked a vol for this slide is because, is because Andre from Alpenzoo has just last week been appointed as the ex situ conservation focal point for the small mammal specialist group. So again, this is something that we're continually trying to, to strengthen these relationships and these connections with your community. When I started in this role, it was quite overwhelming trying to figure out how to link all of the many programs that you have, that your AZA colleagues have, that your zoo and aquarium of um, Australasia colleagues have, with all of the IUCN SSC specialist groups. I'm really grateful that we've been able to set up just in the last two years a new partnership with the Indianapolis Zoo, who have become what we call the Global Centre for Species Survival. This team in particular work as a basically an extension of the SSC Chairs Office team, working with all of the taxonomic specialist groups within our remit to try and uh, strengthen priorities across assessment, planning and action for species conservation, but also helping to build these kinds of relationships. So in particular, if you're leading a, a TAG or an EEP program and you're having trouble getting hold of an IUCN SSC specialist group, then please do reach out to this team. You'll see that we have a mammal coordinator, fresh water, plants and fungi. We have birds and invertebrates. We're currently recruiting for a replacement amphibian coordinator and a marine coordinator. And these individuals have really strong relationships with all of the specialist groups and can help facilitate those partnerships and discussions as well. So we've really grown our ability to uh, act as a dating agency between you and specialist groups where needed. On that point, we also continue to expand, similarly to you. Um, we continue to have new taxonomic and thematic specialist groups. If you want to know more about the process for proposing new groups, if you work on a species that you think needs more global cooperation, that you want to be yeah. elevated within the international stage and to bring the experts for a particular taxa together or theme to do with conservation, then please get in touch with us. We're more than happy to, to talk you through the process of proposing a new specialist group. But these are some of the ones that have been created in the last few years. You see things like Behaviour Change Task Force, which is relevant to lots of the work that many of you do, and a big push you might notice for invertebrates. We're really trying to in increase the uh, invertebrate representation in our network at the moment, and fungi as well. One that I just realised is not on here is our new Fungi Conservation Committee, which calls themselves the Fun CC. So uh, if, you're, if you're working on fungi conservation, which is the, often the forgotten kingdoms of conservation, then please come and talk to us. We uh, just partnered with Leonardo DiCaprio as well for a campaign around mycologically inclusive language. So if you're talking about diversity and inclusion in your workplaces, ours looks like doing more to raise the profile of fungi. <laughs> so we're working with governments around the world to try and encourage them to scale up not just flora and fauna conservation, but also fungi. Um, so again, love you to consider more about the impact that you could play and the role you could play in saving fungi species around the world, or even just helping us to know which ones exist. I also mentioned we have a new forum, a new structure within the SSC called National Species Specialist Groups. This was actually triggered after the Australian bushfires when we realised that we were being asked by lots of different stakeholders to comment on the impact the Australian bushfires were having on Australian species. But the SSC has functioned through its history much more at the global level. We bring together the global experts on amphibians or on cacti or on parasites, um, but we, we really haven't played much of a role in convening multi-taxa experts at the national level. So we couldn't, we have 410 registered experts in Australia at the moment, but we didn't have an easy way to bring them together to talk about the cross taxonomic impacts of something like bushfires on Australian species. But this is becoming more and more relevant with the new targets that my family just mentioned around the CBD where countries, 196 countries have committed to very ambitious conservation targets, um, including for species. And we really want to enhance our ability to work more at the national level in support of national players like yourself, but also in support of government agencies, helping to achieve our species conservation targets together. So to do that, we've created a new structure. We don't create the specialist groups, we create the structure, and then we work with communities and experts to propose specialist groups where they make sense in those countries. And so this only opened as a new structure six months ago. And so far we have specialist groups in these countries. Just to pick one example, which may not surprise anyone here, the China Species Specialist Group started less than six months ago and it currently has 350 members working across 15 different working groups. They have a massive partnership with the government of China and are able to work in local languages 
and so are able to also provide a forum for Chinese species experts who haven't been able to engage in English-speaking forums to come in and work enormously in a coordinated way using IUCN international tools, but driving forward species conservation priorities in China. You'll notice through my slide, I have quite a few of these exclamation points. There are, if you pay attention to nothing else that I say, those exclamation points are opportunities for you to think about in particular how this might, um, how you might be able to take away some of this into your institution. And one of them here is that we don't have any national species specialist groups in Europe yet, and that's okay. There's lots of functions and structures and lots of government agencies and national bodies functioning in Europe. So maybe a national species specialist group isn't necessary. But it is something for you to think about. If you think that there's um, a value to convening the, the species experts in your country under an IUCN specialist group, then please come and talk to me. I'm more than happy to send you any of the information about that or talk to you more about the kinds of roles and functions these groups can play. Or certainly if you're doing conservation abroad, a great opportunity is to connect with these specialist groups uh, who, who all have relationships with government agencies and many of the conservation players in the country uh, if you don't already I'm going to change gears for a minute now and talk about some of the organizational partnerships. Again, we've heard about a few of them already this morning, but there's been a really fantastic history of many of you partnering, I already mentioned, with the Conservation Planning Specialist Group. Copenhagen has long been, Copenhagen Zoo has long been a regional resource center for CPSG. We've also had many EASA members who have partnered with specialist groups and hosted those groups and become kind of secretariat functions for those groups whether it's the Zoological Society of London with pangolins, Marwell Zoo with antelope, Bristol Zoo historically with lemurs, Chester Zoo with Asian wild cattle and a number of others, and Durrell with small mammal specialist group. And these relationships have been instrumental to working between our communities to further the conservation assessment, planning and action for these taxa. And there's also been really fantastic programmatic partnerships between the other community and SSC groups. For example, some of your campaigns your campaign on Asian species action, which turned into the ASAP um, program, which EASA still functions um, in, in really close partnership with that group, scaling up priorities for critically endangered species across the Southeast Asian region. The Asian songbird, the Asian wild cattle specialist group, um, both David and James are here in the room. So if you wanna know more about those partnerships, please talk to them. We also have a number of EASA members that partner directly with our SSE Chair's Office. The team, the small team of nine of us that help to support the 9,000 volunteer experts in the SSC around the world. And these partners either provide financial support, programmatic partnerships, or work with us to create centers for species survival, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But I want to in particular thank these, these partners who make my work and, um, and the work of my team possible in support of the network. I've been asked already quite a lot in the last two days, which is very exciting for me, about the Centers for Species Survival. This is a model of partnership that really takes a lot of lessons from the partnerships I've already discussed and tries to expand that to grow the capacity that we have across our different communities in acknowledgement that a lot of the work that you do is, as TAGs and EEPs is volunteer, a lot of the work of specialist groups is volunteer, and really what we need to move it forward is more capacity with an expertise with time to help move forward the priorities that we identify for saving species, as well as local community connections and institutional partnerships. So we've been working with, um, with organizations around the world, in particular zoos, aquariums, and some botanic gardens, and just this year, a couple of NGOs, to create centers for species survival that involve putting on new full-time staff teams that work with and as staff of those institutions but dedicated to partnering with SSC specialist groups on moving forward priorities that we agree together on assessment, planning and action for a specific region, theme or taxa. Again, I'll show you the network of these centers uh, next, but if you wanna know any more information about this, then please just let me know, I'm happy to share. And um, this is our network as it stands today. Uh, we have many other centers for species survival in discussion. You'll notice that in Europe, we have, so in the EASA region, we have the CSS Macaronesia with Laura Park, and Javier is here in the room. We have CSS Marine with Oceanario de Lisboa, and I think, I think Nuria is here, but hopefully there's someone from, from Oceanario here and I just haven't connected yet. Uh, CSS Ireland with Dublin Zoo is a new center for species survival, and Christoph is fist pumping over there, and Andrew, so please talk to them. 
CSS United Kingdom with Paradise Wildlife Park, who is one of our, who is our longest running CSS in Europe, actually alongside Oceanario, and CSS Cologne Zoo, which is also just getting started this year as well, and Theo will be here on shore. Um, so if you want to know more about the work that those centres are doing, please feel free to talk to them. Uh, we also have a number of discussions underway, and I hope I'm not breaching any kind of we're not there yet, but we've got discussions actively, for example, with the Lemma Zoo in Stuttgart, with Alpen Zoo in Austria, um, with uh, Royal, Society of, Royal Zoological Society of Scotland in Edinburgh. So lots of discussions um, for what this could look like to expand centres for species survival in Europe. Um, but this model is really taking off in a very exciting way. You'll see that on average, we created two new centres for species survival partnerships over the, uh, per year for the last six years. And this year, we've already signed eight new Centres for Species Survival Partnerships and expect three or four more by the end of the year. And what's exciting about this for me is that we're growing this really fantastic network of species experts that, um, that have dedicated full time to working as catalysts within your institutions. Now, I don't want to take away the fact that many of you have conservation experts on your staff already, but these staff are there specifically to work as catalysts between your work and your programs, the IUCN SSC programs, government agency action plans, and to really pull those together to drive priority actions on the ground and the data that helps inform those. Now, a lot of my talk today is focused on the partnerships and the convening and the strategies. I don't want to, it would be remiss of me to, to not mention that the actions that happen on the ground are many. And the reason I'm not covering too much of that is that they're so varied and there's so many of them. But I do encourage you to talk to any of these partners in the room about the work that they're doing on the ground to save species, because there's lots of really exciting work happening across this community. Shifting gears again to look at the work that we've done on tools, policies, and processes. So I've already mentioned some of the EASA processes like your exit to, um, your exit to structure. The EASA office and community and IUCN members within IASA have been really fantastic in being active in IUCN motions, elections, and key votes on topics like human behavior change, wildlife trafficking, the one plan approach. It's really fantastic to see the power of this community represented in IUCN forums like the World Conservation Congress, where 1,300 government and NGO members come together to decide on the conservation priorities for the world and you represent an enormous voting block and a very powerful community in that forum. And EAS has done a fantastic job at helping to raise awareness when those votes are happening, to help participate in those processes. And so I really encourage you, if you're an IUCN member in particular, or if you just want to engage with the EASA, the EASA office on those processes through their membership, then please do. It's really exciting to see you being a really visible, valued part of those discussions. We also gave a little bit of support to the EU Zoos Directive when that was going through. There's really great expertise that's contributed and or led uh, IUCN tools from within the EASA community. The Zoological Society of London was one of the founders of the IUCN Red List and still sits on the Governance Committee. Many EASA members contribute to IUCN Red List assessments. Um, Copenhagen, so Kristen Luce uh, led the IUCN SSC go guidelines on the use of ex situ management for species conservation. You endorse as a community and use the translocation guidelines of the IUCN SSC. And Durrell played a really key role in de developing the green status to look as an additional measure to the red list, but looking specifically on measuring species recovery and prioritizing species recovery efforts. So there's so much expertise between our communities that we're really trying to foster and, and to grow. Um, on that point of participating in IUCN forums and discussions, We've been trying for some time now to really raise awareness of um, and recognition and value of the role of zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens within the IUCN community. One element of that is trying to increase the access of you all to become IUCN members. And to date, it's been really quite cost prohibitive. The membership fee for IUCN is calculated on operational budgets. Obviously, running your facilities means you all have much larger operational budgets than your traditional conservation NGO. So we've been trying to raise awareness with this with the IUCN Council now for three years, which has been a really great opportunity for us to talk about the incredible work you all do and how important it is to have you more strongly represented in IUCN membership. As a result of this, because of our bylaws, the Council has agreed to try and push forward a, a reduction in dues structure and the way that we calculate dues for venue-based organisations. 
primarily driven by trying to encourage more participation and, and access to zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens. However, because of our bylaws, this has to go to a vote to all of the 1,500 member organisations of IUCN. So it will be very disappointing if it gets voted down. So if you are an IUCN member or you know IUCN members, if your governments or NGOs that you partner with are members, please encourage them to vote this, this uh, vote up in November. It may seem like an academic exercise to you, but it, um, it could mean the difference of tens of thousands of dollars in membership fees for zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens, um, but also more widely a recognition of how key it is to have you as a strong voice in the IUCN community. And on that same note, back in the 60s, a precursor to WAZA requested from IUCN a position statement outlining the role of zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens in species conservation. This may seem like it should have been a re reasonably straightforward exercise, but politically, it's taken since the 60s for us to be able to move this forward. It's also been a long-term strategy of mine for the last eight years, and we finally got there. It just last week got approved by the SSE Steering Committee for publication. So we're preparing this document to be launched in the upcoming WASA during the upcoming WASA conference in the second week of October. And I hope that you find this a valuable position statement for you to point to. We certainly as an office get contacted more and more frequently, unfortunately, especially by government agencies around the world, asking for us, asking us on our position of the role that, that your communities play in saving species. And we really wanted a robust statement that not only acknowledges the many and varied and critical roles you play in saving species, but actively encourages government agencies and NGOs to be more respectful of this role and to work in a more coordinated and collaborative fashion with your communities. So these are the three objectives of the document, to highlight and celebrate the many roles that you play, to urge zoos, aquariums and botanic gardens around the world if they're not fulfilling their conservation potential to do so, and to encourage the conservation species community to work in a more collaborative and integrated fashion. I won't read out uh, this statement, but uh, it, I can make it available and it will be published again in, um, in a couple of weeks' time. But it really tries to highlight those things that I just said and tries to give examples as well, not within this statement itself. The document is seven pages long and it finishes with a list of some examples of the many and varied work that you all do in saving species in situ, ex situ, and in, through community and political engagement. We would love your support in launching this document. It's in traditional IUCN fashion, it's a, quite a dry document that reads like a policy document. Um, and so we would love to work with you for more public facing communication around this. The value of this document is for you to lean on to, set, to show that IUCN is really supportive of the work that you're doing. Um, and so we invite you to work with us during this week, the October 8th to 12th, to communicate through your audiences and to your communities the incredible work that you're doing in saving species around the world and to link to this document. Again, if anyone wants more information, please let me know. But just um, one of my final things is to talk a little bit about this initiative that I hope you've heard about by now. Teo has done a wonderful job of championing this through the Yaza and Waza communities the last couple of years. But Reverse the Red is a global partnership movement, in particular trying to support countries to achieve target four of the global biodiversity strategy. And we see such an enormous role uh, that you're all already playing in this, but for us to do more together. And it really feeds nicely off of the work of your IAZA 21 Plus campaign that's been running the last couple of years. Really, uh, these are a couple of opportunities for you to think about what Reverse the Red could mean to you. WASA is releasing a short guide for, um, for Zoos and Aquariums in October, which will be really helpful for you to check out. But in particular, what we're asking you to do is to look at your country if you're not already and get a deep understanding of the baselines and progress that your government agencies are using to measure and drive forward extinction risk reduction and species recovery. To ask, and, to, and to ask you to tell us which species you as an organization are committing to reversing declines for by 2030 or contributing to the reversing of declines and to encourage you, if you're not already, and many of you are, um, to get actively engaged in your national biodiversity strategy and action plan that your country is leading. There's funding here, there's legislative weight here, and, the, and these is, this is the forum in which we can bring together our work to save species collaboratively and in a united and strategic way. We also ask you, if you do have species success stories, which I know all of you do, to share them with us um, and to change the narrative in saving species from being one of doom and gloom to one of hope and optimism. And on that, 
Um, we're having the World Thesis Congress in May 15, 2024. It's an online 24-hour event. It's designed as a 24-hour event to work with key regions all around the world to showcase what's happening, what are the leading practices in national biodiversity action plans, what are leading zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens and NGOs doing to reverse declines and saving to reverse declines in species, and what are the tools and strategies that we can all use to this this decade actually meet our targets for reversing species declines. If you want to know more information about the World Species Congress, come and talk to me or, um, or use this QR code and it, it will take you to a web page that will give you more information. And then finally, I just want to say again, thank you for all of this incredible work and, um, and to say how excited we are to continue expanding the work that we all do We've heard already this morning, and I didn't go back into the biodiversity crisis and how important it is for us to save species, because I know that so many of you are already doing this work in so many different ways. Um, but I think that we already know how to save species. We just need to do more of it to access more government and community support and funding and to really work together in a coordinated and collaborative way. And I'm so proud that EASA and SSC already do so much of this. Um, and I think that there's only room for us to continue to expand this and having an even greater impact for species on the ground. I'm very excited that just last night, the ink is still drying, we signed uh, another two-year agreement to continue moving this partnership forward until the change of the SSC leadership that will happen in two years' time. Um, and so we, can, we continue to look forward to the work that we can do together. Thank you again, and um, another thank you to the incredible supporters of the SSC Chair's Office who helped to make our work happen. Thank you very much. Very much, thank you, Kira. We do also really appreciate uh, the work with you. And as such, um, I'm closing the first session. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for the for all the presentations. And uh, I extend my thanks to the corporate members as well. Uh, we don't want to burden you uh, with special housekeeping notes. We have an excellent smart application. Uh, you can see everything on, on the application. Um, nothing left just for you to enjoy the coffee break and then encourage everyone to visit the, the corporate member stands and uh, the uh, research posters and uh, let's enjoy the incredible amount uh, of the world-renowned Finnish coffee. Thank you very much.